Welcome back. In the previous lesson, we learned how vaccines work in general, and specifically how mRNA vaccines work. In this lesson, we'll learn about some other attributes of mRNA vaccines that make them so promising for future vaccine development. We'll also learn about some current limitations requiring additional research. Please take a moment to review the learning objectives for this lesson. One beneficial feature of mRNA vaccines is that they can be readily multiplexed. This means that instead of just delivering a single mRNA sequence supplying the instructions to make only one protein, several different mRNAs can be combined and delivered in a single vaccine. Multiplexing is especially useful when the antigen is a multiprotein complex. In the case of cytomegalovirus, CMV, one key antigen is a complex of five different protein subunits. Combining all five mRNAs, each encoding the instructions to make one of the individual subunits, into a single vaccine enables antigen-presenting cells to produce all five proteins simultaneously, assemble them properly, and efficiently display the complete complex on their outer surface. This multi-protein complex generates a much more robust immune response than if only one subunit were displayed. In addition to the five mRNAs encoding the multi-protein complex, Moderna's CMV vaccine contains a sixth mRNA encoding the CMV GB protein. This protein serves as an additional antigen, enabling an even more robust immune response against cytomegalovirus. Similarly, multiplexing mRNAs into a single vaccine also makes it possible to create combination vaccines against multiple infectious agents. You're likely to remember that the SARS-CoV-2 virus evolved over time to produce different variants that also spread globally. In response, new bivalent mRNA vaccines containing two different mRNA sequences were developed to protect against both the original Wuhan strain of SARS-CoV-2 and a later emerging variant. In the future, mRNA vaccine makers envision developing combination vaccines against multiple different viruses at once, such as a combination respiratory vaccine against respiratory syncytial virus, also known as RSV, SARS-CoV-2, and seasonal flu. With combination or multiplexed vaccines, you might be wondering how drug makers manage to ensure that each LMP contains all the different mRNAs. Actually, this isn't necessary. Each mRNA sequence has its own potency, which is a measure of strength or power. In other words, how many mRNA molecules are needed to create enough protein to elicit an appropriate immune response. Because some antigens are more immunogenic than others, different antigens require different amounts of mRNA to elicit the desired immune response. For most multiplexed vaccines, the different mRNAs are mixed together at a predetermined ratio based on their individual potencies and then loaded randomly into lipid nanoparticles. Because the LMPs are so small, each one can only hold a few mRNA molecules but a single vaccine injection contains trillions of individual LMPs, and each antigen-presenting cell likely takes up tens to hundreds of these individual lipid nanoparticles. As a result, all of the different mRNA molecules are efficiently delivered regardless of which LMP brought them there. In theory, there's no limit to the number of different mRNAs that can be multiplexed. MRNA vaccines are limited, however, by the maximum tolerated dose, or MTD, of the LMP. That is, the largest amount of LMP that can be dosed without causing severe side effects or reactions. As the number of different mRNA sequences increases, the amount of each individual mRNA must decrease to stay under the maximum tolerated LMP dose. The limitation to the number of mRNAs that can be included in a single vaccine, therefore, is not how many different mRNAs can be packaged into a single LMP particle, but how much of each individual mRNA is needed to elicit the appropriate immune response. For this reason, creating multiplexed or combination vaccines requires significant research and optimization to determine the right proportion of mRNA sequences to get an appropriate immune response to every antigen. 
Now, let's talk about the resources and time required to develop vaccines. In this section, we'll compare the traditional process for making annual flu vaccines to the process for making mRNA vaccines. Most current-day flu vaccines, for example, are made from flu virus grown in fertilized chicken eggs, with each egg providing only a single vaccine dose. That means more than 100 million eggs are required every year just to make enough vaccine for the U.S. alone. Imagine how many chickens are required to lay 100 million eggs, and then how much space is needed to raise the chickens and store the eggs. The space where the eggs are kept also has to be carefully environmentally controlled for temperature and humidity to keep the eggs alive. That's a lot of animals, space, and energy annually. Other traditional vaccines are created from pathogens grown in large bioreactors using various types of tissue culture cells. These might be mammalian or insect cells. In contrast to current flu vaccines, 100 million doses of an mRNA vaccine require no chickens or eggs. 100 million doses of an mRNA vaccine can be made in 10 to 20 large-scale biochemical reactions using equipment no bigger than a large refrigerator. So mRNA vaccines have much lower resource requirements. And importantly, no animals or animal products are needed to make mRNA vaccines. Another advantage of mRNA vaccines compared to flu vaccines grown in chicken eggs is that mRNA vaccines can be produced very quickly. Moderna's original SARS-CoV-2 vaccine was manufactured and quality controlled in just 42 days, whereas producing a new flu vaccine from chicken eggs takes five to seven months. Unfortunately, because flu mutates so rapidly, it's possible for the genetic makeup of circulating virus variants to drift substantially between the time vaccine manufacturing begins and when the vaccine is ready to go into people's arms. Further, because the flu vaccine is made from live viruses grown in eggs, there can also be genetic drift happening in the eggs themselves. These twin drifts contribute to lower vaccine efficacy. Dependent on the year, current flu vaccines vary from 60 to just under 40%. In comparison, there's no possibility of genetic drift in the mRNA vaccine manufacturing process. Combined with their much shorter manufacturing times, mRNA vaccines are likely to better match circulating viral variants at the time of administration. Therefore, mRNA vaccines against annual flu and other fast-mutating seasonal viruses could ultimately result in increased effectiveness compared to the current standard. Finally, the relatively small infrastructure requirements for making mRNA vaccines means that manufacturing sites can be distributed throughout the world. For most medicines, the production process and infrastructure requirements are highly specific to that individual medicine. Therefore, they tend to be produced in just a few centralized facilities and then distributed from there. In contrast, an mRNA sequence is simply a string of letters that can be stored digitally and sent anywhere in the world instantaneously. Thus, once researchers have determined an optimal mRNA sequence for a particular purpose, it can be sent out to a network of small manufacturing facilities for local manufacturing and distribution. Because all mRNA molecules are made of just four building blocks, the materials required to produce different mRNAs are the same regardless of their final sequence. Similarly, the ingredients and processes for making lipid nanoparticles is the same regardless of the mRNA sequence or sequences being encapsulated. This makes it very simple to replicate the entire process for local production and distribution. In the future, by enabling local public health authorities to quickly respond to new outbreaks, this could help decrease the spread of novel infectious agents locally, and therefore the threat of another worldwide pandemic. Manufacturing facilities for mRNA vaccines now exist on every continent except Antarctica. There are also efforts underway to miniaturize the entire manufacturing process so that it can fit into a single cargo container ready to be shipped anywhere in the world at a moment's notice. Future innovations might even enable mRNA vaccines to be made on the benchtop. In contrast to their many advantages, 
mRNA vaccines do currently have some notable disadvantages. One is the relative fragility of mRNA. You may remember that the original SARS-CoV-2 vaccines had to be shipped and stored at ultra-cold temperatures and administered very soon after being allowed to thaw. This fragility is partly due to RNA's chemical structure. It has a tendency to break into pieces. The rate at which this happens is highly temperature dependent, so degradation of intact vaccine is significantly slower when it's frozen. Given the severity of the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic and the lack of other alternatives, these strict temperature conditions were tolerated at that time. But maintaining a functional cold chain is very expensive and generally limited to more affluent and populated regions. Therefore, a strict cold chain requirement is not desirable under normal circumstances. The good news is that in the time since the first SARS-CoV-2 vaccines were distributed, mRNA vaccine manufacturers have already made tremendous progress in slowing down the chemical reactions that inactivate mRNA vaccines. For example, as of the recording of this course, mid-2024, Moderna's updated versions of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines can be stored for up to a month in the refrigerator. And there are other ways to preserve mRNA vaccine potency. For example, they can be lyophilized, which means the vaccine is dehydrated and stored as a dry powder. This powder can then be reconstituted with liquid immediately prior to administration. Alternatively, researchers are investigating the possibility of incorporating mRNA vaccines into solid microneedle patches. Microneedle patches could potentially be stored at ambient temperature, would be easy to transport anywhere in the world, and could be administered simply by applying the patch to the skin like an adhesive bandage. An additional advantage of microneedles is that they only penetrate into the dermis layer of the skin, not the underlying muscle. Our skin is the primary barrier that prevents entry of infectious agents. Accordingly, the dermis has even more antigen-presenting cells, called Langerhans cells, than do skeletal muscles. So although intramuscular injection is a very common means for vaccine administration, intradermal administration can generate even stronger responses with smaller doses. Similarly, the greatest protection against pathogens that enter the body through a mucosal pathway, such as the respiratory system, is achieved by delivering the vaccine to the relevant mucosal lining. This stimulates a much stronger mucosal immunity. So in addition to microneedles, numerous efforts are now underway to develop mRNA vaccines that can be delivered to the respiratory or other mucosal systems. Undoubtedly, now that the first mRNA vaccines have proven safe and effective, the next few years will see rapid advancement in mRNA vaccine technologies, both to make them more stable and to increase their effectiveness against a broad range of infectious agents. With that thought, our discussion of prophylactic mRNA vaccines has come to an end. In the next lesson, we'll turn our attention to mRNA medicines being developed to treat disease instead of just prevent it.